Your name is Liam, and you were born on June 21st, 1844, in Ireland, during the darkest years of the potato famine. Your parents, Mary and Patrick, named you with a glimmer of hope for a better future. The year is now 1847, known as the Black 47, when the famine ravages the land, leaving countless lives shattered. Your family endures the harsh realities, witnessing neighbors succumbing to hunger and disease, and the once vibrant fields barren, the crops devastated by blight. The suffering is unimaginable, as people starve and struggle just to survive. Driven by the desperate desire for a better life, your parents make a courageous and life-changing decision. They decide to leave Ireland behind and seek opportunities in England. They hope to escape the grip of the famine to find work and provide a brighter future for their young family. With heavy hearts, they gather what little they have left and bid farewell to their homeland. They embark on a treacherous journey, leaving behind the familiar landscapes and faces they've known all their lives. Finally, after enduring a grueling passage, your family arrives in one of London's poorest quarters, Whitechapel. It lay packed tightly between Old Gate and Spitalfields in the west to the Mile End in the east. Mention Whitechapel, and Jack the Ripper will be most people's first thought, likely followed by the poverty and debauchery of Victorian England's darker and seedier underbelly. Here stood rows of tenement buildings characterized by overcrowding, dilapidation, and poor living conditions. The buildings, mostly multi-story structures with multiple units, each housing several families in cramped and dimly lit quarters. The exterior of the buildings a mix of worn brickwork and faded paint, and a haphazard mix of broken and patched up windows. These buildings, packed closely together along narrow, bustling, and stench-ridden streets, forming a labyrinth of interconnected dwellings. Many of these structures lacked proper maintenance, resulting in crumbling facades and deteriorating foundations. And everywhere, and almost everything, layered with varying levels of coal dust. The air, at times so thick with coal dust and industrial smoke and human sweat, that everywhere there is a tangible sense of desperation. The walls of your first home, a small room within one such dilapidated tenement building. Whitechapel is a bustling hive of people, filled to the brim with souls, bound together by shared hardships and, of course, poverty. The district itself, a stark contrast of life and death, wealth and destitution on the daily. Occasionally, an affluent figure passes through these grimy lanes, their presence a startling reminder of the otherworldly existence beyond its borders. Everywhere are piles of dung from the city's horses, waiting for cross-sweepers to clean it. However, Whitechapel's dung heaps waited longer than most areas for cross-sweepers as there weren't many to pay the gratuity. As a result, these heaps were often left to bake away in the hot summer months or spread themselves out during rainfall, making an awful mess. However, this paled in comparison to the urine and fecal-filled alleyways and lanes of the area. For in the 1850s, there were still no bylaws regulating requirements for tenement toilets. These would not arrive until 1867. As a result, most tenements had none, or if they did, they were not always used, with much of it ending up on the streets. It's a glaring testament to social and economic disparity in the heart of one of the world's wealthiest cities. The mere mention of Whitechapel stirs fear and contempt in the hearts of most of London's more affluent denizens. Yet, beneath its grimy surface, it pulses with life its crowded markets and pubs a stark counterpoint to the towering factories and workhouses. The interior of a typical tenement unit reflected the grim existence. Dim light seeping through often cracked windows, casting 
faint shadows across worn wooden floors, the area hanging heavy with neglect of both furnishings and inhabitants. Peeling wallpaper, revealing layers of faded patterns from long ago. Often the ceiling sagged, burdened by time and the weight of leaks. The rooms were small and suffocating and devoid of most comforts. In one such unit, you now lived with your family, your father spending long hours laboring at a local factory, the grime of hard work etched into his skin. He works with heavy machinery, hauling, pulling, pushing, shaping, and refining. The noise deafening, the work ruling, and the environment deadly. When he returns home, he's a shadow of his morning self, his energy drained by the day's hard labor. His presence at home sparse, and when he is there, he's tired. A weary man with barely enough strength to hold you or your brother. Meanwhile, your mother at home painstakingly crafts matchsticks to supplement your family's income. The process is arduous and physically taxing, with each matchstick dipped by hand into a now known to be potentially lethal compound of phosphorus. Your younger brother comes into the world a few years after you. His arrival means yet another mouth to feed, but it also brings an additional ray of hope and joy. Two years after you're born, the harsh realities start to take their toll on your family. Living in squalor, the sickness that's often been just a door away finally comes knocking. Your younger brother Connor, an already frail infant, falls ill. The symptoms typical of many diseases rampant in these overcrowded tenements, persistent fever, bouts of coughing, and a noticeable quick decline in energy. Despite your mother's best efforts, the medicines procured are meager and the access to a doctor near impossible. A loss of your brother, just another of the relentless hardships faced by yours and other immigrant families in the Victorian era. The shadow of the Great Famine lingers even across the sea in the cramped quarters here in Whitechapel. Later that year, tragedy strikes again. Your father, worn thin by relentless factory work and the grief of losing a son, succumbs to his hardships, his demise swift, his body giving out under the strain of relentless labor. The factory that provided your sustenance now leaves you fatherless highlighting yet another cruel irony of your existence. Your only keepsake to show that he had existed at all was his old lever watch, which still worked and would continue to work for many more years to come. In the span of a few months, you find yourself and your mother alone, fending for yourselves in a world that seems to hold nothing but more hardships. Your mother's matchstick-making efforts redouble. The flicker of hope they represent becomes more important than ever toiling day after day, dipping the wooden sticks into a mixture of white phosphorus and glue, adds to the squalid conditions of your cramped dwelling. The dangerous task of these matchsticks, painstaking, causing the sweet, sickly smell of phosphorus to cling to her clothes and skin, also the noise of her coughing as she worked. The fumes often hang thick in the air at home, each matchstick box an American brand that would be placed in an even larger box with a picture of which your mother tells you is New York City. A city that had many Irish immigrants as well, and that family of your mother's had gone to instead of England. One day she hands you one of the flyers that gets packed with the matchsticks when in groups of 50 they are put away. However, these formative years are shaping you into a creature of the East End, resilient and ready to do whatever it takes. You accumulate and sell rags for cleaning and any other scraps of some worth. The money you both earn, however, soon isn't enough without your father's income. The rent on your tiny room always behind, always on the edge of eviction. And one day after returning from a day of selling rags and other odds and ends, you return home to see your meager belongings tossed all over the grimy cobblestone street. You are now part of the growing number of homeless inhabitants of Whitechapel. During your mother's deliveries to shops selling matchsticks, she'd often cross paths with a woman named Mary. 
the leader of a notorious female gang known as the Elephant Gang. This gang had its origins in Elephant and Castle, an area of South London. The female arm of the gang was a clandestine network of skilled female criminals. They were led by this Mary, who was shrewd and cunning. They operated with precision and audacity. The large enterprise for them was shoplifting in the most affluent areas of the city by exploiting the Victorian societal norms that deemed women harmless and unsuspecting. Women were also afforded privacy during shopping, which created additional opportunities. For women did most of the shopping, and it was extremely rare to see any male other than possibly children accompanying women. The women of the gang would sometimes even rely on children for assistance or for use as decoys. With nimble fingers and clothing sewn with concealed pockets, nothing was safe. Trinkets, jewelries, and other items would be pilfered and then fenced by the gang. Mary was a woman with piercing eyes and a calculating mind. She'd been quietly observing your mother, seeing her perseverance despite her circumstances had piqued her interest, particularly your mother's way of engaging shopkeepers and her habit of taking small items for home as the shopkeeps looked elsewhere. Your mother had the look of more sophistication than most in Whitechapel could ever hope to offer, even dressed in her poor clothing. There are moments in any person's life that some may say were faded. Whatever the reason on this day, Mary stepped out from the shadows to extend a hand, offering you both a way out of your predicament. She suggested that your mother join the Enterprise. It's far from the life you imagined, but right now, it's a lifeline, a glimmer of hope. Mary takes your mother under her wing, showing her the ropes. Even at just 10 years of age, you find it strange at first, the contrast between the nurturing Mary and the hardened criminal teaching you to pick pockets and navigate the twisted alleyways of Whitechapel like a shadow. But it's a reality you're quickly growing accustomed to. The Elephant Gang, while all females, did associate with the Elephant and Castle Gang, which was one of the larger gangs of London, a male gang. It had older and younger members involved in everything from petty crime like pickpocketing to larger heists and strong-arm crimes. You also knew of other youth-only gangs littered throughout London. Here in Whitechapel, there were the Monkey Parade Gang, who were also allied with the Elephant and Castle Gang. Listen Grove had the Marleybone Gang, Regent's Park, the Fitzroy Place Gang, City Road, the Greengate Gang, Duke Street Blackfriars, the Prince Arthur Gang, Norwood, the Gang of Ruffs, but there were many more. The gangs that often clashed with the youth wing of the Elephant and Castle Gang were the new cuts of Lambeth. Your mother's role changes too. She hangs up her matchstick-making tools and instead takes on the risky task of shoplifting. As mentioned, it was a different time, a time where women's roles were restricted, but also underestimated. They were often left alone to peruse goods, the one large freedom afforded them via shopping, the men of the era rarely accompanying them. You also now live in slightly better building and unit, and for a time, life is more stable. Many uneducated children at your now age of 12 are already apprenticing if they are lucky, but most are working in the factories, odd jobs, or crimes. Your mother, perhaps out of guilt, given what happened to your father, tries to keep you close to her side. You work as a decoy and also as an assistant with your special small jagged with hidden pockets. As time flows relentlessly forward, you find yourself adapting. The adrenaline rush of a successful heist, the calm getaway, and even the thrill of danger all become part of your daily life. It's a far cry from the desperate, hungry days that you're slowly starting to forget. But still, tucked away in the back of your mind is the dream of the flyer, the dream of America. A dream that the Elephant Gang's activities indirectly keep alive. And so life continues, full of risk, full of danger, but continues. After your 13th birthday, your mother's health begins to decline rapidly. You remember as it was the last birthday you would share with her, her cough worsening. And within just a few months, she was bedridden and almost skeletal-like. 
Mary and the gang had cut ties with her as soon as work became impossible for her, and your mother was left to fight this on her own. The doctor confirmed the worst, consumption which was aggravated by the years of damage to her lungs from matchmaking. You were both told that there would be not much time left. Still, you hoped and cried and prayed and repeated the process, but your mother got steadily worse. Then the morning that would continue to play in your mind's eye during quiet, reflective times. Your eyes, heavy with the remnants of sleep, struggle to adjust to the dimly lit room. You turn to the bed next to yours, expecting to see your mother's figure curled in sleep, but she lies motionless, her once vibrant eyes now dull and her mouth hanging unnaturally open. Her body is gray and lifeless as the streets of the early morn. The harsh reality crashes over you in waves of intense sadness. Your small world, once filled with the rhythms of daily survival, is abruptly shattered. With the loss of your mother and no family to claim you, you're taken away from your home and thrust into Norwood Industrial School. It was described ten years earlier by Charles Dickens after visiting it. The exterior of Norwood House is as dingy and ugly as a small brew house. In shape, it reminds one most of old cities, built upon no definite plan, but enlarged from time to time as the population found it most convenient. Sir James K. Shuttleworth, an assistant poor law commissioner, also described its interior denizens and routine, saying, Chiefly orphans, deserted, illegitimate, or the offsprings of persons undergoing punishment or crime. They are in fact children of the dregs of the pauper population of London, and have consequently been, for the most part, reared in scenes of misery, vice, and villainy. The industrial section of the boys was confined to the sorting of bristles and the making of hooks and eyes. Occupations of the most cheerless description, incapable of exercising the ingenuity of the children, useless in preparing them for any future duties, and pernicious because they disgusted them with the labor. The girls were taught to sort bristles, to thread the hooks and eyes upon the cards, and were instructed in needlework. They also were partially employed in making the beds and cleaning the rooms. The recreation of the children, not encouraged by any systematic arrangements. What wasn't talked about was the abuse that often occurred behind closed doors. Your days turn into a strict routine, waking up at dawn, a quick wash, and straight into the morning prayer. Breakfast, sparse, porridge with water, and then it's straight into classes. Reading, writing, arithmetic, all taught by stern-faced men with thin lips and harsh eyes. The food, bland. The days, long and the punishments most severe. A missed question, a slow response, even the tiniest error met with a swift and brutal reprimand. You feel a gnawing ache for your mother's warmth, and as with most days, imagine yourself taking Mary and her elephant gang down in sweet and furious revenge. Yet within the confines of the school, you're just an orphan. The system not caring for your past or present or future, only your conformity, but your anger helps you move forward. The spirit of rebellion, though, burns in you, fanned by those memories of your past life and freedom, so long an unremembered dream. After a few months, you spot an opportunity. A minor oversight in the night guard's routine becomes your moment. Under the cloak of darkness, you make your move. You dart from shadow to shadow, heart pounding, every sound magnified in the hush of the night. The adrenaline fueling your determination, and with a final sprint, you clear the tall, menacing walls of the school. You are free again. Your small figure disappears into the coal-fog-drenched night. 